be with each other. Well, welcome to this afternoon session. Um, we're looking at storage this uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, we've got Saiful Islam looking at um, batteries for vehicles, and we've got Dave Howie looking at uh, battery modeling and control. Um, the way I'm going to suggest we run this is that we'll just run through both presentations back to back, and then we'll gather uh, in the, the middle here and we'll have a chance to have some questions. But the way I'd like to run the, the, the question session is more as a dis an open discussion so people can kind of interact and work with each other. Okay, so without any further ado, Islam, uh, Faisal, yes. Saiful, that's your, off you go. Great, thank you. First of all, thanks for the introduction, and I have to thank Robin for the kind invitation yeah. uh, to give this talk. It's been quite an opportunity to network um, with others in the Oxford NG themes. I'll give it a general title for making materials difference to batteries for transport, and it will be a very, very general talk. And I apologize to the battery experts. Uh, I wasn't sure about the audience for this day, so I've kept it quite a general one. Um, because it's a general talk, I want to give a flavour of the type of research in the group and in, in the wider community. So I'll start off with, since it's flavour, I'll start off with menu. And the, the menu starts off with a brief starter on energy storage, just to put the talk in context. Then move on to the main course, the two main courses, batteries and electric vehicles, and also lithium batteries, materials in particular. And then I'll end with a brief kind of dessert on where do we go beyond lithium. So um, context, uh, energy storage and electrified future. I think we know that we want to decarbonize, decarbonize lots of sectors. And one of the sectors is road transport. We already know that energy storage has been very successful in the portable electronics area. Uh, one of the most successful technologies in the last couple of decades. The next challenge is electric vehicles. Um, I would say two main reasons, um, CO2 emissions, um, and I think increasingly air quality and, and urban pollution is a big factor as well. Uh, for those, uh, I like this diagram, not because I'm a keen follower of Top Gear or battery, but I do like that label that says, actually recharge plug, not to scale. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, the other challenge for energy storage is grid storage with increasing penetration of renewables into our electricity grid. There will be um, an increasing demand for energy storage, particularly because of intermittent renewables. And batteries will play a part in different, in, in different degrees in, in those last two sectors. So the port revolution, I like to show this slide because it kind of reminds me about my youth. And that is 1980s when I was <laughs> going to concerts as a, a UCL student. I went to see the Smiths, New Order, and the Cure. And that's what the audience looked like. But nowadays, I'm uh, trying to see Coldplay, <laughs> Billy Eilish, or Ed Sheeran. The audience would look like that. And that's because of the revolution in portable electronics. And it's all been powered by lithium iron batteries. <laughs> So, first of all, how are batteries impinging on the next sector? So, first of all, why power cars with lithium batteries at all? And this is a, a plot, it's an old one, but I, it reflects the trend. You've got a volumetric energy density up on the y axis, a specific energy density along uh, the bottom x axis. So, basically, lighter weight going to the right and smaller size going to the top left. And you can see, compared to lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, lithium iron has a higher energy density, both volumetric and specific energy. And that's why it's seen to be the choice for electric vehicles, but also other factors. They are efficient um, in terms of energy in, energy out, um, around 90 or greater than 90%. We already have an infrastructure. We have an electricity infrastructure. Obviously, we would like to make that energy infrastructure cleaner and more green and low carbon. But we have that electricity infrastructure, that means charging available. And lastly, they work. I mean, batteries, those mobile phones that we all have in our pockets or right in front of you are not mobile phones, they are mini supercomputers. 
I mean, they are more powerful than the, the kind of computers that sent Neil Armstrong to the moon in 69. So they are really super computers. So in terms of step change advances, um, and I would say this because I'm a material scientist, we do need new materials, we need innovation, and we do need in, um, underpinning science. Incremental changes have occurred, but if you really want a step change, um, we do really need greater innovation. Um, so what's the context uh, before I move on to some materials? Um, the context is that there's been a massive drop in battery pack price. Uh, the plot on the, the left um, shows the battery pack price uh, in dollars per kilowatt hour, and it's dropped tremendously. I mean, the rate of um, decrease is slowing, but it is decreasing. Um, it's projected to decrease further. And I think chatting to today or somebody else, if you compare the price of the battery pack now to what the price was in 1991 when the Sony cell first came out, uh, electric vehicle cost probably half a million dollars and, uh, because of the, the price of battery packs back then. So this has led to, or not led to, but has contributed to the battery market growth. And that's predicted and actually happening. There's a massive growth in uh, in battery, and it's mainly due to the transition to electric vehicles. So this is plot on the right. The blue is passenger EVs, uh, stationary storage is in pink, consumer electronics in green, and the commercial EVs in yellow. So they are all on an upward trajectory. This is data from uh, Bloomberg. Uh, but um, projections have been following similar trends, but I think will continue. And this is all actually promoted by legislation. We know legislation is coming or trying to come. Many European countries are in the process of thinking about banning new petrol and diesel cars from a particular year, maybe 2030. Um, I think Mike mentioned 2032 in this country, but to France and others adopting similar years. And we've got some battery capacity being thinked about here, a gigafactory by British Volt. So there will be greater capacity of lithium batteries and growth. Um, there's always this range anxiety, and uh, this is a plot given to me by Dave Greenwood at WMG in Warwick. And I do like this plot. It's got a cumulative journey count on the y-axis and an average trip distance along the x-axis. And this is data from Department of Transport. And you can see, well, maybe you can't see, but I'll summarize it for you. 90% of UK car journeys are less than 40 miles. And one in two trips are less than five miles, you know, to the supermarket and back, the school run. So actually, the range anxiety is just psychological rather than real. The, the trip to Edinburgh is very rare. And even, even if you did do that trip to Edinburgh, you'd do a bladder break or coffee break in between. So there's lots of, um, so actually, most EVs can cover 90% of those car journeys. So let me move on to my research, and that's to do with the battery materials. So some of you might say, Cypher, what's inside a lithium-ion battery? And I'd say, it's a very good question. And uh, hopefully I'll give you a clear answer. A, a, a battery, a lithium-ion battery, is like an electrochemical sandwich. And like any sandwich, you've got two mm -hmm. red slices. In this case, the two electrodes. The oxide electrode on the left, uh, which is a layered cobalt oxide as a first battery. And on the right, you've got the layered a carbon, graphite, and that's the anode. And when you charge your phone tonight, you're actually giving it to electrons from your mains, and the lithiums are moving from the cathode to the anode. And then when you're discharging your phone or using your device, lithium ions are going the other way, releasing electrons and powering your device. So that green symbol, it's just showing chemistry in action. You are seeing lithium ions moving. But there are I should say there are problems. Cobalt is toxic, uh, can be expensive, and there are real ethical issues about its mining. So we need to move away from cobalt, which we are doing, and I'll explain that in a second. So uh, rightfully, and it's long overdue, the Nobel Prize in 2019 was awarded to John Goodenough um, for his work, and his work was when he was a prof in the early 80s. And Bill David in the audience was uh, part of that work. So for those who aren't sure, John Goodenough is the one on the left. Uh, <laughs> the one on the right is a 
president who believed in science and scientific method. The other two winners were Stan Whittingham, a good friend and colleague who's at Binghamton, New York. And he also has Oxford connection. He did his BA in DPhil in the 1960s in the Inorganic Chemistry Laboratory. And the last winner was Kiro Mishino, who's at uh, Maiko University in Japan. Anyway, that was long overdue, and lots of us in the solid state community were hoping for a Nobel Prize. Um, because John Goodenough is now the oldest Nobel laureate ever. He got it on his 97, and he'll be 100 this summer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so battery materials. So what am I working on? Well, material science, as I mentioned, is critical to advances. Um, lithium battery relies on those batteries. And I wanted to compare the cathode side to the anode side, the graphite side. On the left is a schematic of a layered cathode showing the lithium ions in yellow and the cobalt in blue. But the cobalt was often replaced by nickel, manganese, and to form these NOC materials. So let me show you a plot. And it's a schematic showing the relative energy storage capacity of various cathodes in green, lithium cobalt oxide, NMC, NCA. So NCA, nickel, cobalt, and aluminium. NCA is used in Tesla, NMC in the BMW i3 and others. With purple, the graphite, the anode. And even if you're not a battery chemist, you can see there is a difference. The cathode does not have as high a gravimetric energy density. The volumetric is less of a gap, but still there is a gap. So we need new cathode materials. Now this leads on to a trade institution project that I lead, um, and it's called Next Generation Lithium Ion Cathode Materials. And it's the team is 20 postdocs and 12 PhDs. We also have um, chemists at Bath, Cambridge and Liverpool, and engineers at Birmingham, UCL. And it's really, its remit is can we develop and discover next generation cathodes that can meet the energy density demands. And when making some progress, the conventional cathode material stores energy by using the transition metal ion. For example, the cobalt or the manganese or the nickel. There are these lithium rich materials where the lithium to transition metal ratio is greater than one. And that allows a greater amount of lithium into the system, but also a higher energy density. So the greens were the old cathodes I showed you, the conventional ones, and the, uh, the blues in the center are these lithium rich materials and graphite again in purple. So these lithium rich materials are twofold. One is a layered oxide, similar structure to the conventional, and the other um, area is the rock salt, rock salt structure. Um, rock salt structure we're all familiar with. It's something that we have in our kitchen, good old sodium chloride, the stuff you sprinkle on your chips or pasta, or in my case, before a tequila shot. Uh, and what the disordered rock salts have a low cobalt content, they're largely nickel or manganese rich. We can see the energy density is increasing. In, in one case, nearly doubling the conventional lithium cobalt oxide. So I'll just show one result slide, and this is really lovely work from somebody in the audience, Rob House, within Peter Bruce's group. And they looked at trying to understand the problems within the lithium rich layered oxide. They do present challenges. There's capacity fade, which means on cycling, they lose the energy capacity. And there's a voltage loss. And the voltage loss is shown in that um, curve there in the middle. Voltage against capacity. The top line is on charging, and the bottom line is on discharging. You can see there's a voltage loss. So we want to understand what's going on. And they found that the charging, you have oxygen redox in addition to transition metal redox. What was the character of that oxygen redox? They found that it's molecular O2 trapped in the bulk. And that's shown as a schematic on the top right. So it's a very unusual mechanism. You've got molecular O2 trapped in the bulk. What's interesting on discharge, that O2 transforms back into O2 minus. But it's not a fully reversible process, and hence the voltage drop. But they found that if you look at different structural rearrangements, you can mitigate that voltage drop. And that's shown in the the, the plot on the bottom right, that, that voltage drop 
much reduced, that hysteresis is much suppressed, i.e. that high voltage is maintained, that high energy density. The next step is trying to get this for multiple cycles, but this is really showing that fundamental underpinning science that begins to understand what the problem is, you can begin to mitigate those challenges. And that was published in Nature Energy. So that's work coming straight from the group. So what's the future outlook? Uh, so the future actually is beyond lithium ions. So I'm going to, in the last two minutes, just very quickly touch on some alternative technology. The first one is all solid state. The current conventional battery relies on a, a flammable liquid electrolyte, which does present safety issues. Although considering the billions of cells being sold, um, it can be uh, overdone. They are relatively safe, but you still want to have safer batteries. So can you replace that flammable liquid by a solid electrolyte? And that's what these all solid state batteries are about. Um, they are safer, have greater stability, but they have another advantage. If you can incorporate lithium anode, you can get the higher energy density as well. So that's an area of research and that's being done at Oxford Materials as well. And we published a review uh, a few years back in Nature Materials and got the cover image on the fundamentals of inorganic solid state electrolytes for batteries. Because of time, I'll just move on to the slide. So the other technology, uh, if you haven't heard about sodium ion batteries, uh, you have now. Um, sodium ion is beyond lithium. In fact, you could say it's kind of, it's actually below lithium in the mm -hmm. table. And the reason why sodium has been looked at, it's more abundant than lithium. So that means it's a lower cost. It might not be used in the same applications because the energy density is not as great. Although it could be used for e-bikes, the energy density is not as crucial. Uh, but it could be used for storage with an electricity grid. But what's nice as a, a scientist, it does open up a new plethora of materials chemistry. You can really explore new material science with these sodium ion batteries. So let me move on for the last 30 seconds on concluding remarks. Um, there is a ba battery pipeline and Oxford project, but this summarizes some of the work being done at Oxford. So you start off with all raw materials, which is obviously mine, battery materials that we're developing, electrodes and components that we're manufacturing, cells that we're testing, modules, packs that we're supplying to, vehicle applications, testing, and lastly, we do need to think about second life and recycling, which I haven't emphasized enough, but is a very much a very big issue. So the projects led by Oxford Materials, myself on CatMax, Peter Bruce on solid state batteries, and Patrick Grant on electrode manufacturing, and um, the funders at the bottom, our institution, and EPSRC. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Cypher. If you want to take a seat, then Dave, if you come down, then we'll have the questions sure. after that. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Is this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a small, it's a small lecture. It's a nice lecture theater, actually. I think we should take over this place. <laughs> if you've ever been to engineering, you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> Uh, great. Okay. Well, um, so Seifel had a menu. I've just got one course of about 10 slides. I'll try and keep it uh, short and to the point. Uh, so let's just get this up and running. I'm also the awkward guy who brings his own laptop. Um, okay, great. All right. Well, um, it's good to be here. Uh, so I uh, run a group in, in the engineering department focused on battery modeling and control, obviously. Uh, I suppose just to, to give you the, the sort of uh, sales pitch, Seifel has talked about um, uh, building better batteries, you know, and that's certainly one very important way of thinking about battery innovation. But there's a, there's a flip side, which is we can also think about um, using batteries better, right? So uh, lots of batteries are, um, are commercially made all the time. And in, in my group, we come more from a systems engineering point of view. So we say, what, what can we take off the shelf and get the most out of? And I think so that fits along quite nicely with what Seifel is saying, because that kind of systems engineering approach uh, can work on, on any battery, including future, future technologies. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, 
just to give you a quick overview of what we do in my group, this is my group up in the top right, at least a couple of years ago. Um, uh, we, we mainly work on lithium ion batteries. We have also done a little bit of work on fuel cells and supercapacitors, but broadly the themes are, as you can see here, so, so there's some work on degradation, which I'll certainly talk about uh, now. There's some work on modeling um, and state estimation. There's some work on thermal performance, temperature, and then finally the, <laughs> the one without the, uh, the one without a label is system integration. And actually we have a spin out company called Grill Power, which has an office near the station, uh, which is uh, doing that kind of thing as well. And in terms of the impact of this kind of engineering work, uh, you can see the list here. What we're trying to do essentially is squeeze more out of what, what we've got, as I said. So more energy throughput, less degradation, uh, more accurate sizing of systems. So you're not wasting money, for example, uh, better understanding of the value and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, this is to give you a bit, a bit more context. Batteries uh, are a lot like people. They, uh, they don't wanna be thermally at a very high temperature or indeed a very low temperature. Uh, if you start to go to high temperatures, you can have safety issues, uh, so-called thermal runaway. If you charge batteries, lithium-ion batteries at low temperatures, you can have additional safety problems, something called lithium plating. So there's temperature management is very important. The second aspect uh, that is important is um, mechanical integrity. Um, if you poke a battery very hard, uh, you could have a problem. So it's very important that they come in a, a sort of robust case. This is a small cell like the one that you'd have in a Tesla. In fact, this is a module from a Tesla car. And you can see that there's quite a lot of packaging around that to make sure that uh, the whole thing is safe. Uh, so that's a big deal. Uh, and then finally, unfortunately, like people, they degrade over time. Um, uh, I'm the guy with the hair going gray here. <laughs> and so you can see, uh, for example, the capacity of battery cells, if you put them on a tester and run them for thousands of cycles, gradually decreases. And there's lots of uh, interesting reasons for that. So for the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of our research and how it relates to this. And I'm going to focus particularly on the one on the right, so the degradation piece. Um, but I'll give you one slide on thermal stuff as well. Um, the project that Seifel didn't mention is the Faraday uh, multi-scale modeling project, which I'm part of as well. Um, and it's, it's not led by Oxford, but there's a big Oxford contingent. And so I just wanted to get... Uh, that's okay. No, no, no. It gives me a chance to mention it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things that battery modeling lets us do. So modeling allows us to understand what drives performance. And here's an example from some work being done by one of our former postdocs uh, called Jay Lin, uh, in collaboration with my colleague Charles Monroe in engineering. If you, if you take a thermal imaging camera okay, and point it at a large pouch cell, so this is a lithium-ion battery about the size of an iPad, um, which we've painted with paint so it looks, it looks better from a thermal point of view. Then uh, if you cycle it, you, you tend to get a hot spot forming like this. Um, and if you, uh, if you cycle it repeatedly, you, uh, you, you start to see a, an envelope of temperature as the whole thing warms up and some like little wiggles uh, forming as well, which is quite interesting. So if I show you a video of what this looks like, this is actually a video comparing experiment on the left and simulation on the right. Not the most exciting video in the world, I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you, but um, what you can see is that the hotspot gradually forms, moves down away from the tabs, and there's also this kind of breathing effect, which is quite interesting. So that's what these little wiggles correspond to, and that's related to reversible heating and cooling in the battery. Um, why is this interesting? Well, actually, it turns out that if you take a slice through the temperature of this thing, the curvature in the horizontal direction is actually directly related to the diffusion time in the solid materials underneath. So you can actually start to find out stuff about micro scale effects just from a macro scale um, temperature uh, image. Another crucial aspect of performance is uh, degradation. And um, I would like to discuss this from two different angles, as I'll come to in a sec. Why is degradation important? Well, uh, it's important for a number of reasons. But if you've got an electric car, you might be thinking about your warranty. You, you might be thinking about uh, second life value, uh, you know, selling on your EV to someone else. Um, but also things like insurance companies, you know, they want to know about this. So we do need to understand how to predict battery uh, health over 10, 15, 20 years. And there are two approaches I want to talk about. So the first one is what I'd call a sort of physics-based approach. Um, uh, and this, by the way, this is just a cartoon, obviously. There are many things going on in a battery. It's very complicated. But you know, this essentially says, let's try and understand this stuff from the bottom up and model every single mechanism. For example, 
uh, pores clogging or material dissolution or cracking, uh, electrochemical effects like um, growth of what's called the SCI on the graphite and so on. So we can, you know, look at these 15 different mechanisms, have excellent sort of detailed materials work probing what's going on and then build up models and then try and put that all together. So this is a kind of bottom up physics approach. Um, but the other approach is to say, take a more empirical view, more of a data driven approach and say, well, you know, we want to understand battery aging. The, ana the analogy here might be, I'm going to cook an egg. I'm not going to go out and make a finite element model first and see how long it takes to cook an egg. I'm just going to cook some eggs and see what happens, right? In the same way, there's lots of research groups doing battery uh, aging studies, tons of data coming in. So what we could do is we can just gather all of that and then throw it into machine learning al algorithms, which allow us to, for example, predict battery health based on the performance of similar batteries or use details from the voltage curve to try and predict the capacity at a certain point in time. So this is kind of top down or a degradation, uh, uh, sorry, machine learning kind of approach. Uh, so that's gone very fast, Malcolm. I think Seifel has stolen some of my time. <laughs> um, I'll whip through the rest quickly. Um, so I just want to give you some examples of this. Now, uh, the first one is this kind of physics-based um, bottom-up approach. This is a small lithium-ion cell. Tesla Model S had 7,000 odd of these inside. And what you can see is it's rolled up like a Swiss roll and then you take a layer through that and we can build a model of how concentration is varying in those particles and across the electrolyte in that layer. And then we could add, for example, a model for how the solvent uh, reduces uh, and build that into a kind of virtual battery simulator to, to try and predict degradation. That's all lovely, but how does it matter? Well, uh, one of the projects we've been involved with is um, taking a model like that, putting it into a grid energy storage system model, and then looking at what happens when you trade energy with a big battery connected to the grid under different assumptions. So if you trade energy, generally you've got a price for the energy, which is fluctuating throughout the day. If you take the simple assumption that the battery is just a big bucket for energy um, and you basically uh, optimize against that price. So you, what you'll end up doing is charging the battery when the price is low and discharging when the price is high. And if you ignore degradation, you'll do this a lot and you'll get good revenue, but you'll kill the battery. So then you say, okay, well, I'll put in an assumption that every cycle costs me some money. You do that, you get this red curve. So you charge and discharge a lot less. But actually, by taking these more sophisticated sort of physics in models, you come, come up with a much more complicated profile for how to charge and discharge the battery. And um, if you take these profiles and put them in a battery tester and run it for a year, you get some very interesting results. So this graph actually shows the predicted revenue versus the lost capacity after a year of testing. So this is real test data, not just simulation. You can see that the simple model with no degradation kills the battery. So you lose 15% capacity. You make a lot of money, but you lose a lot of capacity. The more interesting thing is a comparison of the slopes between the yellow and sort of orangey red color. And you can see what's happening there is that with this more sophisticated model, we're actually increasing the revenue per percentage of lost capacity and making the battery, uh, so we're increasing the re revenue and making the battery last longer at the same time. So, uh, and these are kind of, you know, complementary effects. Uh, so you're not just trading one off against the other. So hopefully this is kind of helpful way of convincing you that this kind of modeling can make a difference. The problem is that in these big grid storage systems, um, there's separation between the different layers of the system, which means one company delivers the batteries, another company delivers the uh, electronics in between, another company delivers the asset optimization. And so to make this work, you would actually have to have much tighter kind of vertical integration between the layers. And that's why we, we have a spin out company that is actually directly working on better integration technology to exploit this. Now, I'm conscious of lack of time. So I think I'm gonna skip through this a little bit. We've done some work on data-driven health modeling. I'm happy to talk about that later. Essentially, you feed voltage, current, temperature data from off-grid systems through some machine learning, and it tells you whether the battery is healthy or failing out to a few months ahead of failure. So failure prediction using data. But what I wanted to skip to, I think, is just the outlook slide, yeah. So I think just some general comments to finish. Um, we're working on lots of stuff, um, but broadly related uh, to themes of data and batteries at the moment, and also grid storage. I think Seifel mentioned electric cars quite a lot, but actually grid storage is becoming more, import more important. And I'm involved in a very large project called ESO, just south of Oxford, which has a 50 megawatt battery plugged into the transmission grid. Um, and so we're very interested in what impact that has on the grid. So I think three things to just to finish. On the data side, 
Um, I'm sure you know this if you've done any machine learning, but data-driven approaches are only as good as the data that you have. And one of the big issues that we have in the battery world is that uh, there is lots of data, but it's tied up behind closed doors in companies. Uh, the pharma pharmaceutical industry realized 20 odd years ago that there was a lot of benefits to being a bit more open with data. So I think we're 20 years behind the pharma industry, but if we can catch up, it would be great for everyone. Um, second is that um, scale up of these kinds of algorithms and technologies that I've showed you is, is difficult. And one of the challenges we face is that convincing companies of the financial benefits is tricky. So we might be able to predict that your battery is going to die quite accurately. But then they say, well, OK, I know that's helpful, but how do I quantify the benefit of my logistics being improved or whatever? So there's like additional work to be done in, in that step, which is also quite interesting, I think. Uh, and then a final one um, is that this is more on the systems level, kind of leaning towards what Malcolm does. but Understanding the CO2 emissions impact of grid energy storage is, turns out, very interesting and non-trivial problem. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, as I showed a few slides ago, I've got a price signal, charge and discharge my battery. That's fine. I might make money doing that. What impact does it have from a CO2 point of view? Because generators are turning up and down in the background to, you know, in response to your battery. Um, and actually, um, we put together a proposal, which has recently been funded uh, with EPSC to look at this for, for a couple of years. So we've got a million, million pounds of project that I'm leading um, just on this, uh, <laughs> because it turns out to answer this question, you have to build a model of the UK transmission grid, build a kind of economic model, and then um, see what happens if you like inject power in and out of your model. Uh, it's not as simple as just saying, what's the average generation mix at the moment? Okay, I'm um, sorry to rush through that, uh, but yeah, thanks to my group and some funders and do get your Cheers. Thanks, Dave. So Dave and Saf, you want to join me in the front here, and we're going to ask some general questions, you know, any questions that you want to either to Saf or to Dave or any general questions. So if you, when you start, when you ask your question, if you can just give your name and your affiliation, and we'll take it from there. So are they... Come on, guys. We, we, timing's fine. We, we, we got there in there. Let's come grab a seat. Um, where, what, what's the first question we're going to have? We might stand just because we fancy stand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you can get out of my talk if you want to. Going through. <laughs> okay. Where do we, any questions? If not, I'm going to ask the first one, which is to join to both of you. Dave, you work a lot on. Uh, understanding how you get most out of the batteries, which is what you said. Seifold, you're looking at new battery technologies. The question is, can you marry those two together? To say, can you start to look at how do you get the most out of the new technologies, or is that, is that too difficult? So for instance, if you're starting to look at some of your new electrodes, can some of Dave's work actually help in understanding how you get the most out, or, or is it, do you actually need some, yeah. some and that? The answer is yes, yeah, of course. And do you? <laughs> that, so that's all that project does, for example, uh, device modeling. And uh, you know, I think you, device modeling is really important because batteries are more than just the, and it, no offense, yeah. more than just the anode and cathode. There's an electrolyte in there, there's yeah. current collectors, and actually going from you know, the improvement in cathode capacity all the way up to the implications at the device level is, is non trivial. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that because it's going to be a whole cell approach ultimately. So that means modeling from the atomic level right across to the kind of cell and pack level is very important. Yeah. So in fact, it's being done already. I mean, if you look at the Faraday projects, I'd say most of them involve a degree of modeling across those lexicons. Okay, great. Has that inspired anybody else? Otherwise, yeah, Bill, go for it, and then. Tell you it, uh, it's like the university challenge. Yeah, <laughs> it's the post-lunch session. Yeah, and, uh, I don't think I'll get this one wrong actually, but uh, uh, the Chinese have basically sort of pulled the uh, uh, you know the carpet out from uh, the NMC materials by saying that uh, if you want to go not to cell density but the pack density, then linear marine phosphate, uh, you know, it's pretty well sort of competitive because you can get these blade cells, you can pack them closer together so that, uh, and of course it's actually a lot more abundant and uh, you know, recycling is a lot more of a challenge. So presumably, 
you know, sorting you know, this out at the, uh, at the, at the pack density. And, and I guess and that's more on, on your side, actually, in terms of you know, engineering the whole system together. Surely, you know, I think it's 88% of uh, Chinese Teslas are now LFP. Uh, that surely that's the, that's, the, that's the level that really counts from a commercial point of view. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, sorry, there's probably enough applications that there's niche, you know, there's a niche for each thing in a way. Like you, you might think with uh, air, electric aircraft, that you definitely need the high energy density. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show that energy density is an important part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Uh, yeah, material supply is very important as well. Cost overall, but energy density and costs are linked, right? Because if you increase energy density without decreasing life, you generally improve the cost because you need less stuff. Um, I'll tell you. I mean, you're right. I mean, the lithium ion phosphate, in terms of what's happening in, in the near term, I suppose I was looking ahead to what we can go beyond the current materials. And um, well, lithium ion phosphate sort of has problems itself as well. In terms of power density, I presume, um, but I don't know enough about what Tesla have been doing with the LFP uh, behind the scenes, whether it's mixed with manganese or um, mm. so. Interesting to see how things, how the battery pack market develops. Great, thanks, Paul. Yes, thank yeah. you for hiding it from chemistry. Um, I guess stepping out from the nitty gritty of the battery performance, um, I guess you focus quite a lot on batteries for vehicles, but could you say something about how the, the role you see batteries playing in sort of smoothing the fluctuations from renewables in a bigger grid storage? Yeah, I mean, it's not my area of expertise. So um, I know it's being explored and I know we're going to hear from Chris in the next session about large scale storage. I would say that lithium ion batteries are not really there for long time scale energy storage. So I, I would say that they're currently well suited to, to but in terms of short time scale energy storage, particularly microgrids, if you think about the developing countries, they're, they're, they, they won't be relying on big national grids as we do. So you'd hope, just like telecommunications, they would have more distributed power generation, so microgrids. And I can see where batteries could play a role in those microgrids in, in the developing countries. Uh, but as I said, I'm not a massive expert in that area. I can show you um, <clears throat> an example of uh, the kind of thing going on right now, actually. So I think there's a number of different services that you can offer to the grid from, from batteries. and um, those include things, sorry, I'm just looking for the right video, right? I don't know if you can, could you put this on, on the screen, please? The guys in there. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Great, thank you. Great, I'll show you the video in a sec. But um, so one thing you can do is just buy and sell energy, right? Which is what this is. In fact, I'll play it. Um, so you can charge the battery, like I was saying, charge the battery when the energy price is low and discharge when it's high. And actually in practice, it's way more complex than the simple example I showed. So for example, here we've got three different markets. So there's a day ahead market, the half alley market, and the system imbalance market. And what you're doing as a, as a trader is you're actually buying and selling between the markets. So you can see in the top right, sometimes you've got one high and one low at the same time, and the battery's kind of picking up the stuff that's left over. So it becomes, becomes like a securitized option, if that makes sense financially. Um, uh, and then the, gradually the revenue goes up. So revenue is dropping when you're charging effectively. And, and, and increasing when you're discharging. Um, so it's a very complex kind of optimization and forecasting problem. Um, but this is only one of the services that you can do with batteries on the grid. You can also do things like frequency response at different timescales and so on and so on and so on. And it's, it's a huge growth area at the moment. I mean, this company uh, were acquired last year and you know, investors are getting good returns from, from this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll tell you more over, over coffee. I mentioned just very loosely about short to long time scale. What's the current? Yeah, I've got. I've actually got a slide on that as well. So here you go. This is not my. This is not my graph, but um, this is basically a really helpful way of thinking about long duration storage. So this is a graph from Dan Steingart at Columbia University, which shows 
the capital cost on the left and the duration on, sorry, on the, on the vertical and the duration on the horizontal. Um, and what it says is the maximum capital cost of a battery compared to a gas turbine, right? So to outcompete a gas turbine, this tells you um, what sort of region you have to be in price-wise um, at longer durations. And what's really interesting is, you know, current lithium ion, $200 per kilowatt hour, that basically means you are commercially viable in this kind of range. You might drop to 45, 60 in five or 10 years. That means you can do about four hours of duration now and about 10 hours in the future. Mm -hmm. That is way far less than, uh, I don't know if you went to the renewables talk, but uh, Tom was talking about tidal turbines and how there's, you know, and wind turbines, and there's like a three week lull. So <laughs> if you want to be at the three week level, you're way off to the right of this thing. And the price of your energy storage system has to be like $1 per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my, well, it's not mine, Dan, and I agree. Dan's very nice picture of how to think about long duration storage. Yeah. It's like a few hours at most to be commercially viable at the moment. Yeah. That actually, I mean, the Hornsdale facility out in South Australia, actually, all the numbers are there already. Actually, that was Tesla's big, uh, uh, you know, battery. Uh, yeah. Uh, the short term stuff, actually. And it's, it's enabled them to, to really, you know, it's fast frequency you know, voltage response, and it's enabled them to, you know, to really make a lot of money out of it as well. Like, you see, uh, doing the short term stuff, and it's very valuable and important to stabilize the grid. Yeah. yeah. So that's all here, right? Frequency regulation, transmission, distribution, upgrade, deferral. It's all there. But if we want to get to, you know, 90% uh, renewables grid, and then cope with that three weeks a year when there's no wind, we need a different technology. Yeah. No. Um, I think for Hornsdale, that's the whole of South Australia that they're actually doing the, you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're a small facility, and South Australia is what, two million people, they're actually able to do that for something that big. Mm. Yeah. If you're interested in this whole topic, I think it's fascinating. There's some excellent work being done by Jesse Jenkins at Princeton on this. So it's worth reading his, his papers, actually. Cool. Yeah. So your take on that, actually, because Jesse Jenkins, he, he says a lot that um, basically the firm power is needed. What's your take on going towards like 90% renewable grids? And what is your... I mean, I've, I've seen papers from this guy, which basically say the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of logical that if you like, essentially, the extra cost of going from 90 to 100% it's crazy. renewables is so high you know, like it just shoots up so, so, need clean firm yeah so, so what starts becoming interesting is then rather than looking at long-term storage which is what the, the challenge is do you start to look at trading energy across different ge geographical geostrictions and sometimes that can be a cheaper way of doing it rather than storing it um, so, for instance, you use uh, North Africa or something like that to, to, to do things. This is what Singapore is doing with, with Australia and, and using that, the, uh, the diversity of generation across large, large, time, uh, large length scales ameliorates your, your diversity needed across large time scales. So what's kind of becoming interesting is, is that the time and distance is becoming an important metric to think about when you're looking at the whole system. You can't just look at time scales alone. How do you quantify energy in that sense as well to make it then tradable across? Trade? Exactly, and that's why just you know the Chinese first thought about it. Now the Europeans and the US are starting to talk about it as having a global grid, um, where we actually have a grid all the way around, um, because then you can they can literally trade instantaneously across multiple jurisdictions. Uh, knowing how difficult it is to do grids, I'm not sure that's a necessarily viable option, but it is technically interesting. Yeah. I just want to follow up on that. Yeah. Presumably the invasion of Ukraine is probably putting that into stock, like that actually a global grid is possibly not as really remote. Um, and that was local um, storage and generation compared. Okay. So, 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 the, okay so, so an easy way of thinking about it is, is that the more local you are, the large amount of temporal storage you need because you, minute, you, you lose the diversity of generation sources ac across a larger area. So that means that, you know, if you really go hyper like hyper local like Oxfordshire, uh, Project Leo is the work we're doing there, is you probably need storage for several weeks. Okay. Whereas if you looked across the UK, it's probably about what, seven to 10 days, maybe slightly longer, depending how much you've got. 
Um, but if you look at national, then you can probably get away with the longest time storage needed is about a week, a, a week at any point. Yeah. So it depends on where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking it back to one of the slides. So um, I think battery recycling was something that was meant to be spoken yeah. about. So I, I was wondering if you could touch on that and how um, perhaps the physics-based models can change if, if battery recycling is something that's considered a second life batteries, then can you change your physics-based models to actually go through the degradation cycle much quicker and then look at recycling and sort of create a cycle in that way if, if battery recycling is something that's upscaling? Um, yeah, well, maybe just a general comment on recycling <clears throat> and cycle. May want to say something. Um, it's, a, it's a really important topic, and there's lots of work going on that, both commercially and research. Um, and just to give you a flavour, it's it's a chemistry and a sort of you know a materials processing thing, but it's also like how do you disassemble the packs safely? And there's diagnostics. There's, there's just tons to that problem, and it's something that a lot of people are keen to solve. Uh, there are companies like Umicore. Uh, I think Umicore, yeah, have a commercial plant. Um, which, I mean, I don't know whether it's more sophisticated than you throw all the batteries into a shredder and then put them in a big furnace and then pull chemicals out, but there's certainly valuable materials like cobalt and stuff uh, in there. Mm. Um, in terms of the role of modeling, I mean, yeah, it would be great if we had a model which could virtually cycle a battery, see how it degrades in different situations, and then you could say like, okay, at this point, we, it's better to recycle it than um, repurpose it, but we're not there yet. I mean. There's, this is really tough to, to to model. I don't think we really fully understand all the degradation mechanisms, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So um, on that interesting point, I'm just going to call it quits because I see our colleagues are busy munching on tea. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But, but please use the tea time. And I just want to thank Seifel and Dave in the usual way. And just to, to pick up at, at, uh, at 10 to 3, if you can come back here, we've got Kylie and Chris talking on, uh, on hydrogen and large scale and large temple scale storage. Good. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. That's good. <laughs>